Welcome to Totalis Rankium. This week, Job 3. Uh, welcome to Roman Emperor's Totalis Rankium. I am Jamie. And I'm Rob, ranking all of the emperors from Augustus to Constantine Eleven, And we are on episode 157. Ooh. It's John Trey. Was he Spanish? Yes. No. Cool. No. <laughs> uh, uh, John, John Three. John Vitazzi's. Quite often just known as Vitazzi's. Um, but... We're sticking with our tradition, and we're going to call him John Three, and uh, yeah, I deal with that information how you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I pop it here. Okay, cool. Right, let's start, shall we? Let's do. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do a quick background on the Emperor of the day, John Three. But then, fear not, I will then recap the ever-changing political map because it's all a bit crazy at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. So here we are. The year is eleven ninety-two. And we're in a city not too far west of Constantinople. That's right, you know it well. It's the city of Didimonticcio. Oh, yes, Didimonticcio, yeah. Yes, yes. I know it well. Uh, I went there last summer. Yes, yeah, so was, was it nice? No. No, that's a shame. Did no. you see the olive gardens? Nope. No, no, I said they've been removed yeah. for health yeah. reasons. Yeah. That's yeah. Bloody olives. Yeah. Well, we don't even know for certain if this is the place. This is a theory that this is where um, he was from. And the theory also is that he was the son of a general called Basil Vitazzi's. Basil and his wife, we don't know the name of her, had a child called John Vitazzi's. Hmm. This is John three, And when he was two, Basil the dad died in battle. Ah. Uh. Yeah. Right, there you go. That is all we know on the background of John. It's not much. No. Did you have a favourite colour? Uh, pink. Oh. Mm. What was his favourite medium to do art with? Chalk. Oh. Cool. Yeah, that's good. That's, so that's all we need. That's all we need. Right, OK. Uh, in which case, let's make a couple of speculations here. Uh, we can assume that due to his father's connections, despite the fact his father was dead, uh, he, able to, he was able to use this to enter the military very high up. His father was a general, after all. So he didn't join the army and rise through the ranks. He joined the army at, at the top and sat at the top. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, and soon enough, it would appear he was a prominent member of the Nicene Royal Court. Because by this point, uh, Theodore is the Nicene Emperor. Fair enough. Flash forward to 1216. I'm there. John's in his mid-twenties. He's there as well. He is now... He's got a little beard. He has got a little beard. And he's a popular general working for Emperor Theodore. Aww. Roughly, this is the time in last week's episode uh, where Nicaea is starting to seem like the most powerful of the rump states. Uh, Trebizond, if you remember, that's the one in the top of Anatolia, yep. uh, has been severely weakened a couple of years before this by being defeated by Nicaea. Uh, Henry, the Latin emperor from Constantinople, had died. Uh, uh, his... <laughs> well, he died in his attempt to defeat the new ruler of Epirus, uh, Theodocus, if you remember. At the end of last episode, Theodocus was on the rise. Uh, so it's into this political landscape that John was chosen to wed the emperor's daughter, Irene. Irene. Come on, Irene, he said. Let's get married. Da, 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 da. Yeah. A song that no one knows. No. As we firmly Although... established before. So John suddenly finds himself heir to the Nicene emperor. This must have felt like everything was going well for him. Yeah. And over the next five years, events from the last episode play out. The Latin Empire loses yet another emperor, and then an idiot called Robert was put in charge. Yeah. Theodocus of Epirus starts to become more and more powerful, and then in 1221, the Emperor Theodore suddenly dies. Yeah. Sorry, shouldn't laugh. No, no, shouldn't. And his son-in-law becomes the Emperor, sort of. There's a, a slight problem, because Theodore... He didn't have any sons, so that's why the son-in-law becomes the emperor. Yeah. Uh, but he did have two brothers. And, uh, oh. yeah, Theodore's brothers figured they deserved to be emperor instead of this young guy who had merely married into the family. Uh, now, these brothers were called Alexios and Isaac, and Alexios and Isaac had a plan. They'd wheeled out that blackboard. 
and they'd started to come up with ideas. What we're going to do, they said to each other in unison, because it was a bizarre plan that they both figured out <laughs> at the same time independently to each other. It was very comedic. Were they twins? Um, no, but yes, let's say they were identical twins. Blonde hair, for like white blondy hair. The only difference is that they wore the exact inverse of each other's clothes. So if one wore like armour, they would have to wear the armour inside out? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Nice. And if one wore trousers, the other one would have to wear those trousers on his head. <laughs> Things like that. So <laughs> here's the plan they said to each other. Let's take our niece Eudocia. This is the youngest daughter to the late emperor, not the one who's married to John. Um, so, yeah, this would be John's sister-in-law. So yeah. let's take Eudocia and flee to Constantinople, and then we can offer her to the Latin Emperor Robert. They can get yeah. married, and then Robert can give us some men, and then we can lay claim to the Nicene Empire, bring it under the fold of the Latin, Latin Empire. Yeah. But we'll be in charge, sort of. And they high-fived because it was such a good plan. However, details are unclear, but something went wrong. Maybe they didn't put the blackboard away carefully enough <laughs> the people who had hired the room after them for, for their meeting walked in and went oh what's this oh it's plans it's plans to kidnap Eudocia and flee the city so the the two brothers were caught they were forced to flee Nicaea before they could properly hatch their plans so they fled to Constantinople without Eudocia in fact fled with nothing but their names like not um, even clothes I, I, I don't know uh, apparently just their names but let's let's say yeah literally just their names maybe they had like a board with a name carved on so they could yes have, have some modesty yes i think so that's what they did however this did not put a stop to their plan because uh john who was still trying to figure out how to rule this romp empire that he's uh, inherited uh, soon found out that theodore's brothers had indeed been given an army by the latin emperor Ooh. so they didn't bother with the marriage part of the plan, but the rest of the plan still worked. So <laughs> yeah. they were being invaded. Not good. Uh, but don't forget, John might be quite young, but he's also a military man. So soon he had his forces up and running and ready to meet the threat. We have very few details on this battle, unfortunately. It took place south of Constantinople on the Anatolian side of the Bos Bosporus. And I will quote our source where we get most of our details from today, which is a man named George. At first, most of the Romans were nearly defeated, but the emperor himself, with a very few men, accomplished a total victory, winning completely. For he took hold of a spear and hurled it at the enemy, displaying a brave spirit in that war which had not gone unnoticed previously. This victory greatly enlarged the Roman Empire, while it contributed to the contraction and collapse of the Italians. Do you think there were two, like, guards standing behind saying, great spirit, terrible aim because it's in my foot? It, it, it's a bit strange, isn't it? I mean, yeah. like, come on, George, you could have told us how it was won, but apparently John picked up a spear and threw it and everyone was mightily impressed. And uh, Wow. There you go. Went, there. went pointy side first this time. Well done, sir. Um, yeah, and apparently this was so good, the Nicene Empire just becomes bigger and bigger and the Latin Empire just starts to collapse. Hmm. So, yeah, that's all the details we get. The, the brothers were captured and blinded, so that's Aww. nice. But they were both blinded, so they still look identical, so it's fine. Oh, good. John is now the undisputed Nicene Emperor. No one is going to be tackling him for the throne anymore, I can tell you. But what to do now? Sort stuff out. Yeah, well, I mean, the Latins are on the back foot. They seem weak and distracted after that mighty display of throwing the spear, apparently. So let's just keep going, thinks John. He systematically goes about taking up all of the Asian land held by the Latins, almost up to Constantinople itself. In fact, the Latins ended up with only the city of Nicomedia in Asia. Wow. Yeah, so this is really good. The Latins also, by the way, are very distracted by Theodocus in the European side of the empire because he was doing exactly the same on the other side. <laughs> in fact, Theodocus was able to take the region of Thessalonica from the Latins. Now, Thessalonica, the region, had within it, fairly obviously, the city Thessalonica, which was the second city of the Roman Empire before Constantinople fell. So this was a big thing to capture. Uh, Theodocus then starts to systematically take all of Latin's European land. Uh, Robert in Constantinople being really squeezed here. His, his lands go down to pretty much Constantinople and a few towns around it. I mean, that's not ideal. 
it's it's not it's not great. Robert gives up. He starts showing very little interest in anything apart from partying and his mistress. Um, his mm. barons get a bit fed up at this point, so they break into his bedchamber one night, slash the poor woman's face up until she's unrecognisable, and then drown her in a vat of water. What? Yeah. It's not her fault. Well, it is. She's the only woman in the story, Jamie. Keep up. Oh. We all know who's to blame. What if he was annoyed? <laughs> he was terrified, apparently. He fled. Get, he fled yeah. west. He ran to the Pope, saying, help, help, Pope, help. Um, Pope didn't help. So, yeah, Constantinople, which uh, was now, as I say, pretty much the only thing that the Latin Empire had, was now weaker than ever. The emperor had gone. However, John could not take advantage of this because his cousin attempted a coup. Damn it. Uh. Yeah, well, John was on campaign at this point. He was pushing against the Latins still, but he was forced to burn down a fleet of boats that he'd prepared to make sure they didn't fall into the hands of the Latins. Yeah. And then he headed back to his capital, where he set up an investigation. Soon enough, he'd learnt the names of everyone involved, but he decided to be lenient. He imprisoned his cousin, who was uh, in charge of the coup, and he blinded two of us and cut off their hands, because apparently they were particularly nasty. Uh, but everyone else involved, he just let go. So, remember that's how lenient I am. That's kind of nice, yeah. Yeah. That yeah. is nice, apart from the whole hand blinding thing. Yeah, if you're the one losing your eyes and your hands, you won't be going... Oh, how lenient. Um, what a guy. <laughs> I'd give him both my hands. But no, uh, generally, coup's put down, everything's fine. Yeah. So, what's next? He's pushed the Latins out of Asia. Trebizond is now so weak that they're no longer a threat. All he had to do now was take down his biggest rival, and that is Theodukas, who now had most of the Balkan Peninsula, so most of modern Greece and a bit more to the north. After this, Theodukas had declared himself emperor. So there's now John III and Theodukas claiming to be the Roman emperor. John had written to Theodukas saying, no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> you can be a viceroy, I'm the emperor, but Theodukas just took no notice of this and continued to take more and more land from the Latins. Uh, now, it appears that after he took the city of Adrianople, a major city in the region, uh, the residents there felt that they'd prefer John than Theodukas to be their emperor, so they wrote to John asking to be liberated. Or at least that's what's come down to us in the histories. I can't help but feel this was just one of those excuses of, oh, look at this letter I've just found, said John. There's a city over in Europe <laughs> that needs to be liberated. Yes. No, no, it's not in my handwriting. Don't <laughs> stop being silly. And again, we get next to no detail, but it is a success. John doesn't go personally this time, he sends his generals, but they get to the city, they take it and leave a garrison there. So there you go, now that's uh, John taking land on the European side of the empire. He almost has an empire now, you could argue. Almost, yeah, uh, but it, this doesn't last long. Soon enough, Theodukas turned up and just kicked the garrison out. Oh. Rather than the waste men on fighting, Theodukas pointed out that, look, I'm going to win this battle, so... Here are some ships, go home and we'll pretend this didn't happen. John's forces put their tails between their legs, get on the ships and go home. Bit embarrassing, but, um, no well. <laughs> By this point, as you can probably figure out, the power of the rump states have shifted here. Epirus, which was once the weakest, was now arguably the strongest, and now was known as uh, the Empire of Thessalonica, because they'd taken Thessalonica and they'd settled there. So I'll be talking about Thessalonica from now on. So they're arguably now the strongest. He's doing quite well, isn't he? Who, Theodukas? No, yeah. John. John. Well, John's doing well, um, but yeah. so's Theodukas. They're doing about as well as each other. Theodukas has taken pretty much the whole of the, the Western Empire, and John III's taken pretty much all of the East Empire. Constantinople is now a city in the middle held by the Latins. Ah, and, like I say, it's actually Theodukas who is on the rise here. He seems the most powerful. Uh, in fact, it seemed like he was about to take the capital back. And if he can take the capital, it's now a race between Theodukas and John. Whoever gets the capital first, well, that's it. They'd be able to claim legitimacy. They'll have all the fancy buildings and stuff. <laughs> so, in 1229, Theodukas pulls all his troops together and heads to the capital. However, last minute, he suddenly swings his troops north and heads into Bulgaria. The Bulgars. Yeah, the Bulgars, because there was one other strong player who I've not mentioned yet this episode, who was also claiming the Roman throne. 
And this was the Tsar of the Bulgars, a man named Ivar Azen. Nice. Yeah. Good name. Uh, it's a good name. Now, Theodukas and the Bulgars had a treaty. They were currently allies. So Ivar Azen was uh, taken by surprise by this. So, <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Theodukas is invading, but I've got a treaty right here with his signature on it. We agreed Look. we wouldn't invade each other. Yeah, so Azen uh, didn't waste any time. Uh, he quickly assembled his troops. Do you want to know the details? Go on, then. Okay, here it is. The entire quote from George. And, to make a long story short, Theodore was completely defeated by the Bulgars. Nice. So, cheers. Cheers, George, <laughs> for, for cutting that long story short. So I was uh, getting annoyed at how, how long these stories were. He obviously wasn't paid per word. <laughs> <laughs> no, clearly not. I mean, to be fair, we can piece together a few more details, but not much. I mean, <laughs> Theodukas was so confident by his undefeated run by this point that he had actually taken his whole royal court with him. He was moving slowly through Bulgar territory with his wife and his family and his people to entertain him. And yeah, the army as well, but perhaps not taking this as seriously as he should be. Aeson, in the meantime had put a small force together and marched with such speed uh, he was in a position that completely took Theodukas by surprise. Apparently in four days, Aeson managed to march three times the distance that Theodukas had managed to do in a whole week. So Theodukas was not expecting to see Aeson so soon. He oh. realized, yeah, probably partway through a, a conga line, because that's how they were travelling. And then... <laughs> They, they look up and go, oh, oh, we're, we're surrounded. Uh, oh, and we're captured. Oh, and we're, we're blinded. So yeah, just like that, Theodukas just messes it up. I mean, he was doing very well, but no more. Within weeks, much of the land that Theodukas had captured from the Latins fell to the Bulgars. Uh, Theodukas's brother took over a much weakened Thessalonica. And uh, Aeson now became the forerunner to claim the Roman throne. Ooh. Yeah. But what about John? What's he up to? Well, he was mostly sitting back and just enjoying the show. I mean, this is great. Theodukas was my biggest rival, and now he's messed up. And also, um, so send a letter to this Aeson fellow, shall we? Uh, well done for getting rid of Theo D. He said, <laughs> direct quote there. How about we team up and kick the Latins out of Constantinople once and for all? Eh? Yeah. What's the reply? Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, an alliance was made. And to make sure it stuck, John's son, this was a boy called Theodore II, was betrothed to the daughter of... Well, this is the, the daughter of Ars, Arson, whatever. You got it. Of course yeah, he was. Yeah. Yes. Not only that, but the Bulgars also broke from the Western Church. Ooh. No more saying yes to you, Mr. Pope. And they created an orthodox patriarchate once more. There we go. The Bulgars are back in the Eastern Christian fold. And mm. the two rulers uh, have connected themselves with a the marriage. So that's looking good. Yeah. Yeah. And with the two most powerful rump states now working together, it really only seems a matter of time before the Latin Empire falls, doesn't it? Because everyone's just looking at Constantinople. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. But what's been going on in Constantinople, I hear you ask? Well, remember, Robert fled, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he did. His underage brother, named Baldwin, was left in charge. <laughs> Baldwin, just being a young kid, uh, well, the Latin nobles in the city realised, oh, no, this isn't going to do. We're yeah. really struggling. We need a strong leader. So they sat around, they had a, a good old chin stroke of a meeting, and uh, someone suggested, uh, how about John of Brienne? Another John. Yeah, everyone's called John. Yeah. Um, yeah. Someone went, J John of John of Brienne. As in the the king of Jerusalem up until about five years ago. Yes, that's the one. As in the John who led the Fifth Crusade about ten years ago. Yeah, yeah. The, the John who went east and got married to the Queen of Jerusalem about twenty years ago. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, her. Him. Him. The, the one who ruled the county of Brienne about twenty-five years ago. Yeah, hence his name, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the John who owned all the estates in Champagne about 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and how old was he then, about 30 years ago? Oh, I'd say about his 50s. Yeah, about that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's fine. Yes, this man's approaching 80, uh, but that's perfect. 
he's respected, and he'll die soon. Um, but hopefully enough time for Baldwin to just get that little bit older. So, yeah. And there's nothing we like more than a power vacuum. That's exactly. Cool. So, yeah, so they sent for the old man. Come on, old man, come and help us out. No, I, should... I don't want to leave me alone. Well, apparently he was up for it. Um, oh, go pa- on then. Apparently he had a daughter at this point who was only four years old. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> But I should point out it's disputed how old he was. Our main source, George, claims he was about 80, but he was only about 13 when he saw the guys. And when you're 13, everyone looks about 80, don't they? True. So, yeah. So who knows? Anyway, so it's uh, this old man who was in charge of the city when John III and uh, Aeson turn up in the region. And yet again, we have few details. I'll just quote George again, shall I? John had been tested by many battles and was so highly esteemed that everyone was of the opinion that there never had been and never would be anyone who had undertaken such feats or had accomplished so much. High praise. Yeah. Aeson, for his part, had control of the territory beyond and to the north of the places mentioned. Both men went as far as the very walls of Constantinople, where King John sat on them and watched, and they struck great terror into the Latins. But since autumn was ending and winter was approaching, the Emperor John and Aeson took leave of each other, the latter departing for his own land, that of the Bulgarians, while the Emperor crossed over to the east. So big campaign of uh, fighting where they managed to take even more land and secure their own regions. Uh, but we don't get any Brilliant. details. No. Apparently apparently they just go home after the summer. Uh, but <laughs> before they left, they did agree, same time next year? Yeah, why not? Same time next year. Sounds good. But that winter, John of Brienne dies. Ah. Oh. Because he was very old. Yeah. Uh, and everything once again changes politically because Aeson had been having a think. I mean, the Latins are now weaker than ever, and what's going to happen when Constantinople does fall? It'll go to the other one. I want it. I want it. Yeah, I mean, let's face it. John III is going to betray me, he thinks. I'm I'm a Bulgarian czar. He's claiming to be the emperor of the Romans. I mean, there's no way I'm coming out on top here. No. So, he writes to the emperor saying, I'm in Adrianople at the moment. Um, Any chance I can see my daughter? Just to see her. Be nice to see her. So could you send her to Adrianople? That'd be great. Okay. John sent his daughter-in-law to Aeson, but with a note. I'd like to think the daughter-in-law had in her hand. Uh, I will quote the note here. If you should detain her and deprive her of her legally wedded husband... There is a god who observes everything and visits punishment on those who transgress oaths and agreements which they have entered upon. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, like if you're just doing this so you can move against me and keep your daughter safe, I'm not going to be happy and God will know. And so, oh. will, so will Father Christmas. Not Santa. Yeah, exactly. So be good, Aeson. Be good. But Aeson didn't care. Once his daughter arrived in Adrianople, he grabbed her and headed back to the Bulgaria with her. According to George, our Roman source, the daughter was very distraught because she really loved her new husband, and Aeson beat her around the head until she stopped crying. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. He's but not it, nice. I liked him in Ego. Uh, but, don't, but don't forget, this is our source, George, writing. And well, true. Yeah, um, how true this is, who knows. Anyway, Aeson then signs a treaty with the Latins. Why don't we go and invade the Nicaeans, he says. So, they start building up their forces. However, if we believe our source, George, Aeson's wife then dies. Oh. As does one of his daughters, not Helen, who is the... Uh, the Betrothed. Yeah. Uh, well, no, actually wed now. They did get oh, married. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, it's a different daughter. But not only did Aeson's wife and a daughter die, but also his favourite bishop. Oh, no. Yeah. What a weekend. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All in a tragic accident. Should never send them boating for the afternoon. <laughs> well, Aeson saw this as a punishment, apparently, for his betrayal of John. So apparently wrote to John and ask for the treaty to be put back together. I'm really sorry, I'll even send Helen back to you. So, um, John accepts. Fair enough. Yeah. Excellent, he thinks. He's quite forgiving, isn't he? Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he could fight this, but why bother? Well, yeah. Yeah. 
It's like, okay, I mean, I'm not going to trust Aeson again, but if you say you're not <laughs> going to attack me, then fair enough, send Helen back. Back in Constantinople, Baldwin, still very young, was now in charge, though. He's now 11. Uh, a bit older than that, but not much mid-teens. It was decided he was going to write to the Franks and ask for help. And France sends 6,000 troops, including a whole bunch of knights. So that's cool, isn't it? Knights? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, they travel east. Uh, eventually, they get to Aeson's lands, Bulgaria, and uh, Aeson just waves them through. Yeah, fine. Off you go. Go on, then. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, John decides not to question this. Let's pretend everything's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I could point out that you're supposed to be allied with me, but you're letting my enemy through. But then I'll just have to fight you as well as these Franks. So. And that's, you, don't, you don't need that hassle. Not no, you Tuesday. don't. Exactly. So, Baldwin receives his troops and starts taking some of the Latin land back, using them. So John was forced to go back west and fight these forces. However, there's a slight problem. The man in charge of the navy turned round to John at this point and said, our, our navy's awful, by the way, sir. We have no ships, sir. Well, it's, it's not that they didn't have ships. They had quite a lot of ships. They didn't have anyone who knew how to operate them. <laughs> it's all full of Jeffs. Yeah, exactly. It's the whole family, sir. <laughs> this is awful. Um, apparently, according to the leader of the Navy, it's like, it doesn't matter how many ships we've got, even if we had twice the boats of the current Latin Navy, we would still lose. But So, John did the only sensible thing. He fired the man in charge of the Navy and replaced him with someone with more faith. Jeff. Possibly. Because <laughs> it turns out that you need more than just faith. Yeah. Yeah. The Nicaean navy set out with 30 ships one day, and a naval battle happened against 13 Latin boats. Ah. And you can probably guess what happened. Bad things. Bad things. Yeah, they got destroyed. So this is a shame. Everything had been going really well up until this point, but this was uh, a bit of a blow. But it's, it's not the end of the world. I mean... Most of the fighting is not taking place on sea at the moment. It's embarrassing. It's not something you can't recover from. But then a visitor turns up. Jeff? No, he died in the naval battle. Oh, as did yeah. all the other Jeffs. Oh, no. Apart from one. Oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> the family line continues, don't worry. Good. <laughs> yeah. There were 30 Jeffs at this point. Gosh. And uh, 29 of them died with their ships. They all went down with their ship. They didn't have to. They didn't have to, no. They chose no. to. Yeah. I mean, ships weren't in any way damaged. <laughs> they went down with their ships because they accidentally sank their own ships. <laughs> Apart from one who did also sink his own ship, but fortunately this Jeff hadn't even managed to get the ship in the water yet. So <laughs> Somehow sank on dry dock. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he was, able, he was able to survive. But no, uh, th there was a different visitor. Uh, this was the brother of Theo Ducas. This was Manuel. <gasps> Manuel. Yes. <laughs> now, what a guy he is. Well, he ha was in charge of Thessalonica after his brother's death, Theodukas. Um, however, Manuel said, hmm. um, a third brother, he's just turned up and deposed me. Another now, one? Yeah, now because everyone's got the same name, we're going to call him Blind Theo. All right. Because Blind Theo had been captured alongside his brother, Theodukas. And no. uh, he had been blinded. Hence the name. Uh, well, no, no, it was called Blind Theo before that. Oh, OK. Yeah, it was, uh, they all had a laugh about it. It's yeah. like, oh, it's the Wouldn't irony. it be ironic? <laughs> yeah. But uh, we don't get the details, but after Blind Theo had been blinded and put under arrest by Aeson, Blind Theo then marries Aeson's daughter. Oh. Yeah. Bit, bit strange. Was it in a vague attempt to make things better? Well, we don't know. We don't get the details. We, it's like, how he managed to do that? Who knows? Quite the charmer, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, as soon as he married Aeson's daughter, Aeson then releases him and says, yeah, go on then. Go back to Thessalonica and depose your brother Manuel if you want. I don't care. And Blind Theo, not being one to let his blindness slow him down at all, manages to sneak into the city of Thessalonica, dressed in rags, reveal himself to some key people, and then take over the city. That's, that's quite cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder how many people he revealed himself to before... <laughs> it is right I! <laughs> and then a wide shot of him talking to a tree. <laughs> Fear not, for I'm here! 
Yeah. There's about 30 of those until finally yeah. heard someone say, oh, Blind Theo, yes, <laughs> it is I. <laughs> So yeah, Blind Theo is now in charge of Thessalonica. Manuel escapes and uh, decides, I know, I'm going to go and ask John 3 for help. Maybe he'll help me out. Well, John 3 figures, well, I've got nothing to lose here, have I? So Why not? Yeah, Manuel, here you go. Here's some money, some ships, some men. Go back west. Um, yeah, let's just keep that area weak by letting the <laughs> infighting carry on. However, this backfires slightly when Manuel crossed over to Europe because... Um, he meets up with his brother, Blind Theo, plus a fourth brother, who I won't bother mentioning the name, he's not important. No. The three brothers meet up and decide, actually, wouldn't it be better if we don't fight and work together and we just keep all these ships and money that John III's given you, Manuel? Well, that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense, doesn't it? So, damn, says John III. Uh, that's annoying. Uh, and then, lots of people died. Tends to happen. It does tend to happen. The one closest to home was John's wife, Irene, daughter of the old emperor. Oh. Yeah. There is a particularly amusing section, or at least I found it amusing, um, in, in our source at this point, because George uh, was 21 at this time, and he worked directly with John and Irene. And he recounts that Irene dies. Then goes on a side note of an entire page about the time that he was trying to explain how an eclipse occurs. What? Now, bearing in mind, this is the same source that keeps saying things like, uh, and I quote, to make a long story short, Theodore was completely defeated. Um, <laughs> but he then spends an entire page talking about this one conversation that he had with Empress Irene. And also there was someone else there, there was another man there, who, and I will quote George here, was a man with very little knowledge of philosophy. <laughs> so you've got Emperor John, you've got his wife, the Empress Irene, you've got this man with very little knowledge of philosophy, and you've got George, and they are discussing uh, how an eclipse happens. Now, this other man happened to be a favourite of the Empress, and also disagreed with George. Now, you've got that wrong, that's not how eclipses are made. Uh, apparently, the Empress hearing this, then called George a fool. Ooh. Yeah. She then asked John... So her husband, is that going too far to call this young George a fool? Uh, John, who was quite fond of George, apparently, took his wife's side, saying, oh. and I quote, yeah, it is nothing unusual, for he is young, and the name is not altogether unfitting. <laughs> now, after about a page, like I say, of this story being recounted in quite some detail, George ends the anecdote with one very simple sentence. And I'll quote here, as I said, this empress died. <laughs> In brackets. <laughs> yeah, you really do get that sentence. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Wait, Irene dies? Yeah, Irene's dead. Oh, how'd she die? I personally think George poisoned her. <laughs> I'll show you an eclipse. Yeah, eclipse this. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, obviously, this was a big deal to the royal family. However, mm -hmm. more importantly, politically, was the fact that Manuel also died at this time. Oh, Manuel! Yeah, he was in the story, but briefly. Um, he's dead. Uh, and also, so does Aeson, the Tsar of Bulgaria. Ooh, power vacuum, brilliant. Yeah, exactly. As you can imagine, this hugely affects the balance of power. Uh, Blind Theo is in Thessalonica still, although very weak militarily, um, had decided to proclaim his son emperor. Yeah. His son obviously was called John, so we're going yeah. to call him Little John, because um, he was little. Yeah. Now, obviously, Blind Theo couldn't declare himself emperor. He was blind, after all. Um, but Little John's emperor... Now, this happened a while ago, and up until this point, uh, John III just didn't really care. Uh, but now he realised, although weak, this now technically is his biggest threat, so let's get rid of that, he thinks. He invited Blind Theo to his palace for a feast to discuss the future of the Empire. Oh, is that... Blind Theo's blindness apparently also meant he was unable to see obvious traps. Uh, <laughs> because... After a nice meal, he stood up to leave and was told, Oh, no, Blind Theo, you're a prisoner now. Ah. Uh, More cake. That's sad. Uh, yeah, might as well. 
Might as well. <laughs> After the winter was over, John heads to Thessalonica. He got there with no problems at all. The Bulgars were now being ruled by a boy and not in a state to do anything. The Latins were far too weak, and uh, Thessalonica slash Epirus uh, were running scared. So uh, John III just gets there with no problems at all and sets up a siege of the old empire's second city. A few days later, however, some news reaches him from his son, Theodore II. Some interesting developments in the East... Uh, Probably nothing to worry about, his son said. But there seems to be this new band of barbarians sweeping through the Muslim states with quite some speed. Not more. Um, yeah, I mean, these ones are... They seem a little bit scary. A little bit more scary than the usual ones. What are they doing? Any idea who I'm talking about here, Jamie? Caliphate? No. Oh, no, no, they are ripping through the caliphate. Oh. Like a hot knife through butter. I don't know. This is the first mention we get of the Mongols. Oh, Mongols! Hey, oh, oh yes. dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> now, it's the first time we've mentioned it. Obviously, the Romans would have heard of the Mongols by this point. Genghis Khan had died 10 to 15 years previously. Oh, thank goodness. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Gen- Genghis Khan is dead. The Mongol Empire's already exploded onto the map in Central Asia. Uh, it was on its third Khan by this point. Uh, But now this unstoppable force had started to reach the Caliphate region and was also starting to swing over the top of the Black Sea into Europe. Uh. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Suddenly the Bulgars, who were very weakened anyway, had a lot more to worry about than the power struggles in the old Roman Empire. Yeah. However, thinks John, as long as the Mongols don't come into Nicaean land, this is actually quite good. Yeah, we're fine. Yeah, uh, because the Caliphate will be weakened, the Sultanate of Rum will be weakened, Trebizond will be weakened, the Bulgars will be weakened. Um, This will pretty much weaken all of my enemies, as long as the (laughs) Mongols get bored and go home before they reach Nicaea. He orders all of his army to wear the most boring clothes possible, and if they kill you, don't (laughs) scream, don't don't act scared, just go, oh, okay. How do you deal with a bully? Ignore them. Yeah, you just ignore them. <laughs> so how, how you deal with the Mongols? You ignore them for long enough, they get bored of killing you, and they go yeah. away. Yeah. I don't care if you're speared in half, you just go, oh. But not, not even that, to be honest. F- fingers and ears. La, yeah. la, la, I can't hear you. Yeah. Start saying, I know you are, you said you are, but what am I? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> John needs to decide what to do. Does he head back to Nicaea with all his forces? Or does he keep up the siege on Thessalonica? Bring him back. No. Oh. Instead, he orders anyone who has already heard about this to stay completely silent under <laughs> oaths of pain. Don't um, you mention a damn thing. Yeah. Well, John, John figures, it's like, look, even if we do go back, everyone seems to be reporting that this is an unstoppable horde of barbarians. The likes the world have not seen since Attila the Hun. And we remember him. Ooh. Yeah. So even if we do go back, there's nothing we can actually do about it. If we go back, they'll just steamroll through us anyway. Oh, well, yeah. And we'll lose what gains we've got by sieging Thessalonica. So let's just cross our thing- fingers about the Mongols, shall we? And just okay. carry on sieging Thessalonica. Okay. Fingers crossed, sir. Yeah. Oh, a true patriot. Well done. Yeah. Fortunately, very well trained the troops. They all crossed f- fingers in unison. You could hear the soft whoosh of Ooh, fingers nice. being crossed all nice. at the same time. Um, and this pays off uh, because not long after this, Little John accepts terms. He would stay in Thessalonica, but he would stay as the despot of the area under the Emperor John. See, when you, when you hear despot, did that have a different meaning back then or was that just a word you're choosing to use? No, different meaning back then. Right. In the same way um, dictator, dictator. Yeah. had a different meaning back then. Yeah, this is just someone who is ruling under the emperor. Uh, right. So, John heads home and receives more good news. Ooh, splendid. Yeah. The Sultan of Rum really wants to meet up and uh, formalise a peace treaty because he's quite worried about these Mongols. <laughs> and, <laughs> They're scary, sir. They're very yeah. scary. Yeah, so uh, John happily accepts, great, I don't need to worry about the Sultanate of Rome anymore. And then word reaches him that the boy ruling the Bulgars has died. Yay! <laughs> oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Should, shouldn't laugh. He's yeah, well. that's, that's the Bulgars uh, even weaker, so this is great. And it would appear 
that everyone crossing their fingers like they did is paying off because the Mongols seem to not be coming their way. Mm. They seem to be more busy going down into the caliphate and just slicing through the land there instead. Well, that's uh, better, isn't it? That's nice. Um, so John decides that this will be a good time to invade his last biggest rival, which is the Bulgars. Yeah. They're still not as powerful. They are severely weakened, but this is a good time to invade. Now, John happened to be in the West at the time. He wasn't at home at this point, because a couple of years had passed, and he was doing an inspection tour of all his, his holdings and his troops. So when he learns that the boy ruling the Bulgars has died, he decides, you know what, strike while the iron's hot. Let's just go in. We're close to Bulgaria right now. We, we could be there in no time. Um, his generals point out, oh, are you sure about this? Uh, we don't have an invasion army with us. We set out with an inspection army. <laughs> a well, well-armed inspection army. Yeah. At this point, John turns around and notices for the first time that all the troops are just carrying clipboards. Oh, no. <laughs> Even worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and his advisors then say, look, we're at peace with the Bulgars, and the Bulgars are really struggling, so we don't actually need to do this. Yes, technically they're our biggest rival at the moment, but... They're so weak, we could probably just ignore them. Yeah. Do we really need to do this? And actually, the nearest city to us is quite well defended. If, uh, if our records are right, that is a tough city to take. And do you really want to get bogged down in a long siege? Those Mongols could turn around at any moment. Uh, however, John was determined. Nope, we're going to do it. So they headed towards the nearest Bulgar city. His advisor's still telling him, no, we need more men. We've not got enough men. We don't have enough equipment. Uh, John turns around and points out, well, what, what about all these men? Surely we've got enough men. Who are these guys? And at this point, he points out a group of men who were the servants of the soldiers. Oh, now, we, I did we... not sign up for this, sir. <laughs> Now, we I said really... I work with your family for years, but I mean, fetching cups of tea, not... <laughs> well, we very rarely talk about these people, but, I mean, the soldiers weren't the only people marching in the armies, obviously. You've got people who were just there to carry things and stuff. Yeah, I, mean, I think, if I remember correctly, towards the end of season one of the series, there was a battle between the servants of two armies and the two servants' <laughs> sides fought each other in some kind of battle. I seem to remember something like that happened. I bet the generals love that. Deck chairs <laughs> out. Go on, lads! Right, well, um, at this point, John points at these servants and says, well, they, tell you what, they can take the lower city. Uh, so we'll send them in first. And then once they've taken the lower city, the, the real troops can take the citadel. How about that? Says John. One servant. Taking the city? <laughs> There's four of us. I'm wearing a tuxedo. <laughs> well, I'll quote here. The servants took their bows and swords as well, and some boards, which they improvised as shields. <laughs> Saucers, cups. <laughs> and holding these in front of themselves, <laughs> they Terrified. raised the battle cry and advanced. Tally-ho. <laughs> how, how do you think this goes? Oh, badly. No, nope, incredibly well. Wow, well, buttered eyes are surprisingly bendy. Apparently, this city had been sacked relatively recently in all the turmoil of the modern age. So the lower city had been all but abandoned and the walls had been hastily rebuilt unmortared and apparently were not in any way high. They didn't say how high they were, but I get the impression we're talking sort of chest height here. Right. So all the butlers just scramble over these loose rocks and just go into a city where hardly anyone's in there and look around for a bit and go... Victory? Hey! <laughs> Victory! John, at the end, how, honestly, I did not expect all that. Sir. That was quite a spectacular. Well, so yes, it was a particularly sharp crumpet. Yeah, so there you go. They have uh, they take the lower city, and then the man in charge of the city in the citadel, seeing the lower city fall... Died of embarrassment. <laughs> well, just gives up. All right. I imagine John looked very smug that evening whilst eating with his advisors. <laughs> I bet Said. the servants are even more smug bringing the tea in. Yes, sir. <laughs> War hero. Uh, uh, yeah. They do the odd flex of their muscles when they put things down. And, yeah, I bet anyway. they did. Yeah. Accidentally break a teacup. Whoops, <laughs> don't know my own strength. <laughs> oh, reminds me of the skulls I shattered earlier. <laughs> yeah, things like that. Um, 
So there you go, uh, they take it. With this first city fallen, many other cities in the area simply start to switch allegiance. They start seeing where, where the wind's going. And I'll quote George again here. In a single moment, John became lord of many towns and lands without war, battle, casualties, or shedding blood, or triumph of sword over body. He ruled over these places without toil, calmly and tranquilly, as if this were just some paternal inheritance that belonged to him. Hmm. So... There you go. It's an incredibly smooth takeover of the region. The Bulgars then send him a message. Um, fine. You know what? Have Thrace. Have this region. Please leave us alone. We're quite busy at the moment. We won't retaliate. You, you can have it. Honest. Can you just stop now? John goes, yeah. Okay, then. He now has all of Nicaea in the east, and he's got all of Thessalonica and Thrace in the west. He's pretty much surrounded Constantinople. He's um, doing well. He is doing very well. All his rivals are now destroyed or so weak they can do nothing at all. So it's time to take the capital back. To begin with, he took those few towns that Latin still had around Constantinople. But then, just before a siege of Constantinople can properly take place, there was an invasion of the island of Rhodes coming from the west. John was distracted by this and figures, you know what, I, I could go over there and take Rhodes myself. That can be part of my empire. So instead of going for Constantinople, interestingly, he just busies himself with Rhodes for a couple of years uh, and yeah. was quite successful, which is good. Uh, but then, in 1254, and I will quote, the emperor was sitting on his bed one evening. Part of the night had passed when suddenly he lost his voice, fell forward on the bed and was completely speechless from this time on. Doctors gave their assistance and made light incisions on his legs, but the emperor lay motionless all that night. The following you should have day, them. it's my throat, not my legs. <laughs> he lay motionless all that night, the following day, and again the next night. He was ill with apoplexy, and it was so severe that it sustained long term paralysis and speechlessness. However, he recovered and regained consciousness, but his colour was changed. So this He's now green. Well, this didn't kill him off, um, but he spent the next six months suffering from attacks that became increasingly worse, and he was unable to speak throughout that whole time. Were there uh, strokes? He, um, I, we, we can't tell. That's all the information we get on it, but yeah, something like that happens. He decides to enter a monastery to get closer to God, but this didn't alleviate his suffering. In fact, he just got worse, and he <laughs> died in November of that year. <laughs> Shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have, no. Shouldn't have. So there you go. John three the Tatsis, is dead. Do you know what? Incredibly impressive. Yeah? Yeah, no, impressed yeah, like with he, him. He, he built back an empire, pretty much. Oh, it's, it's pretty good, isn't it? Um, yeah. Okay, shall we rate him, then? Yeah. Let's rate the hell out of him. Fighting Fight Maximus. Okay, uh, he did a lot of fighting, but we don't get many details. I mean, to begin with, he was uh, a general in his own right. And then when he becomes the emperor, he manages to defeat uh, his uncle-in-laws in battle. So that's good. Yeah. If you remember, he threw a spear and it mightily impressed everyone. <laughs> Pointy side first. Yeah. Um, and obviously he manages to uh, siege Thessalonica. He manages to take uh, the city in Bulgaria uh, mm. <laughs> by sending in the servants. Uh, we do have this quote about how he approaches battles uh, from George. He did not like battles fought in close combat, for he feared the fickleness of Ares, and took into account the uncertainty of these matters, which is an amazing way to say he was bricking it. <laughs> he but, arrows. But he won victories by exercising patience, and by spending the spring, the late summer, and sometimes even the winter in the land of the enemy, leaving the adversary exhausted by his stubbornness and endurance. So he just outweighted his enemy apparently he he won by strategy rather than just plowing in which that's, is a that's that's sensible yeah. um so yeah i mean he does well but we don't have any great stories apart from him throwing a spear and also um <laughs> most of his victories let's face it is because the other side was falling apart it wasn't because he victories are victories though victories he are won, victories. he won every battle and he didn't win every battle remember he won most battles. He won most battles. Um, he lost all those ships. That was Jess' fault, though. Yeah, it was Jess' fault. Um, so, I mean, it's good. I'd say he's got to get better than average, but there's nothing, like, amazing in there. Um, I think a healthy seven. I'm only going to go for six. Fair enough. 
is a 13. Caprobium Crazium. Well, he's going to struggle here because um, we get a, a fair amount of detail on certain things, but there's nothing really crazy in his story. Um, he seems to have been very lenient many times. Uh, and I'll quote George again. He was a gentle man who was always disposed to be kind. It was his practice to give more gifts to foreigners than to his own people, and he was especially generous to ambassadors in order to win their praise. Again, um, that's strategy. That's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing unless you're trying to win points in a appropriate pro crazium. Which he obviously didn't think about. No. Foresight. You need foresight, John. Yeah, now apparently he went a bit wild with the ladies after his wife died. Yeah. Um, that is pretty much all I can say. He then does remarry, by the way. Um, but it wasn't that important to the story, so I didn't mention it. Um, but uh, I, I just, I don't know, was there? Yeah, nothing major. No, no, not really. Um, is, is there anything we can give him a point for? The hands and eyes? Not really, did, no. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to give one point for the fact that he took out some eyes and chopped off a couple of hands, just because at least that's something. I'll join you, fair enough. Yeah, it's two for Probium Crazy. Okay, next. Successes Ultimate. This is more his round. He started off, to be fair, arguably, with one of the uh, the most powerful of the Rump States that had come out of the Shattered Roman Empire. Um, but he ends up being the only serious power out of those Rump States. I mean, if he hadn't have suffered from whatever he suffered from, uh, he most likely would have got Constantinople shortly mm. after this, and restored the Roman Empire fully. Um, but he doesn't quite manage it. But, I mean, it's it's pretty good. Yeah, he's got land back that I didn't think was going to happen. Yeah, yeah, this is And in the close. West as well. Yeah, this, this is, I mean, it's still tiny compared to how it used to be, but this, this is now getting not quite so embarrassing. What we're talking about here is the very left side of modern-day Turkey, pretty much all of Greece going up into North Macedonia sort of area of today. Uh, and obviously without Constantinople. And also with the Greek islands as well, with Rhodes. Uh, that, that's what he's got. So, I mean, compared to just a few hundred years ago, it's still embarrassingly small. Yeah. But compared to at the start of the episode, where it was just a sliver on the left-hand side of Anatolia, I mean, this is much better. Yeah. Yeah. I just hope the person after him will do just as well. Well, we will see, but we're not judging the person next. That's as a son no. or two. We're judging John three. So um, we don't get many details about his internal policies. Uh, we can assume that things are going relatively well, though, because we don't hear otherwise. The army um, aren't starving. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So. Paid. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to spoil Tempo Completo, but he manages to um, keep things stable for a while. Mm. So, um, generally, I think this is pretty good. So, I think an eight for me. Yeah, I'm going to go for eight as well. I'm impressed. Image of face. Okay, right. Have a look what he looks like. He looks very similar to the last one. <laughs> yeah, get get used to this image because uh, there's a certain <laughs> style and a certain fashion from now to the end of the series. Big hat, lots of beads, pointy cool beard, yeah. very cool beard. I mean, it's not just pointy, but the two points are curled, which is very cool. I like that. Yeah, I'm just I'm just going back to the predecessor, uh, predecessor Theodore, because um, he had a curly beard, same eyes, same moustache, same jewelry. In fact, if you go on for the last one and you hover above, you hover above John's name, you get two at the same time. They're almost identical. Yeah, they, they really are. Um, I'm going to have to go middle of the road, to be honest. I mean, yeah, me too. Yeah, I'm going to go for five. Yeah, I will match that. So it's so 2.5. 2. 2. And how long's he last, do you think? Ten years? No. Five years? No. One month and seven days. You're going the wrong way. Oh, 87 years. <laughs> no. He rules from 1222 to 1254. That oh, is wow. 32 years he rules. Wow. Yeah, is I when 
like just flicking through which emperors are coming up next, um, I'll spot how long they ruled for, and that usually gives me a vague idea whether it's going to be a long episode or not. I assume this mm. episode was going to be a lot longer, um, but our sources just don't give us much detail. So that 32 years flies by. You really mm. don't get the sense that it lasts that long. That's why I mentioned in Successor's Ultimus. Uh, a lot of his success was the fact that he didn't die when almost all of his rivals <laughs> did. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, 32 years gives him a very impressive score of four points for this round. Mm. So, um, what's his score? 35, 37.5. 37.5 is not bad at all. That's impressive. Not quite 40s club, but um, well, that's pretty good. That is pretty good. He's, he's fingers on the door that goes into yeah. the attic with a 40s club in, so... Yeah. Okay, well, he's a sort of question, doesn't it? Mm. Do they have a certain je ne sais pas? Is it good think, enough? Yeah, I think yes. Good score. Successful. We, we gave it to his father-in-law, didn't we? Theodore uh, won. Yeah. And between the two of them, they have managed to get from literally nowhere to being a stone's throw from restoring the Empire. Yeah. If it wasn't for Theodore and John, this series would have already ended. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm happy to give it to him. Well cool. done, John Three. You have Jenny Caesar. Hey. Woo. Hey. Bye. Uh, great. Okay. Mm. Next time, it's his son. Theodore 2. I'm sure he'll do just as well. Well, I mean, you are aware that the Roman Empire is restored at some point, aren't you? Yeah. So do you think it's going to be Theodore 2 who does it? Um, yeah, why not? Okay, well, we'll see, won't we? We will see. Uh, but that is next time. Uh, thank you very much for listening, everyone. And thank you for following some Podbean, iTunes and Stitcher. Mm-hmm. And thanks for giving up on us as well. <laughs> like most people do in our yeah. lives <laughs> yeah yeah i'm talking um, to you dad <laughs> <laughs> see how i made something of myself at the end <laughs> yeah right okay well thank you very much for listening and uh until next time watch me throw this spear <laughs> goodbye bye Hello, good sir. Ah, good, good evening to you. How are you? Oh, very well, thank you. Um, we're here to invade, I'm ter- terribly sorry to say. Oh, to, to invade? Oh, gosh. Yes, is is your master in? I'm, I'm afraid not. Well, there's one left. He's having his own little party, his own soiree. The Citadel having a Ascapatina crumpet. My gosh, how did you get over the wall? Uh, well, we, um, I think the military phrase has uh, stepped over it. Ah, yes, I, yes. that's quite in vogue nowadays. Yes, I, I, I hate to inconvenience you like this, uh, but oh. uh, my my master uh, has given me uh, a somewhat unusual duty, uh, but uh, I'm going to have to come in and slit all your throats. Oh, slit my throat? Well, and yes. I mean, that would put a damper on evening tea, I've got to say. Yes, I'm very sorry for the inconvenience, but apparently this is how one plays it when you're invading a city. I guess this is what one does when one has to invade a city, what what. But yes, so if you could just sort of lean over slightly, I mean, how do you, how do you want to do this? Shall I sort of just go in from the top, or do you want to so- full slice across the air? Uh, the neck. Well, I, I, before we begin, I, I'm, so, I'm being so rude. Please, please come in, come in. Oh, thank you very much. That's, uh, All right. Uh, would you mind taking off your shoes? Oh, it's, they're already off, dear boy. Oh, yes. Already off, yes. So, anyway, where were we? You were about to cut off my head. Oh, don't, don't worry. Don't let me go as far to cut off any heads. We're not uncivilised. Uh, a simple slicing will do. Okay. Um, I, shall I call the men? We can line up for you. Um, Oh, are there more of you? Oh, there's about 30 of us, yes. Oh, 30. Oh, good gracious, there's only four of us. Oh. Oh, that's a bit awkward. Oh, that is terrible. Oh, I'm, I'm quite embarrassed. Uh, I was reading the situation completely wrong. Oh, gosh. Uh, 
Well, oh, I don't know where to look. Well, why don't you come in for some tea? I mean, be oh yes, no, steady, steady my nerves, and um, well, I assume this means you're you'll, you'll be slaughtering us then. Of course, handshake. Handshake. <laughs>